My name is Shirley Frost. Danny Andre. Matthew Mozafari. Amanda Cruz. My name is Christina Gallatin. I am undecided. I don't know what to vote for. I am undecided. I'm an undecided voter. The most important issue to me is climate change. The most important issue to me is ensuring that students have the right tools and knowledge to enter the technology industry. I'd sleep better at night knowing that there's quality care for my children. I have a question. I have questions. And I need answers. It's my turn. It's my turn. And here we are again in the National Studio in Toronto tonight, where we are and have been doing something different all week long. We promised you that this election would be about you, the voters, your questions, your concerns, what you want to talk about. So we decided to give over our interview time, much of it anyway, uh, with the federal leaders to you. Welcome once again to Face to Face with the Federal Leaders. I'm Rosemary Barton. Our studio today, again, uh, full of some undecided voters looking for answers ahead of October 21st. And we've invited another five of those voters from across the country to come and speak one-on-one -on -one with the leaders. They each get five minutes. They can do what they want with it. And after their conversations, I will probably jump in. But really, this time belongs mostly to the voters. Canadians have already heard at this point from Justin Trudeau and Andrew Scheer. And tonight, Green Party leader Elizabeth May joins us. Welcome, and thanks for being here. Thank you so much, Rosemary. Thanks and thank you time. to all the wonderful voters who've shown up. Thank you. Uh, to be transparent, just so everybody understands the rules, we only gave you the first name, uh, the hometown, and general topics. Mm -hmm. So you are coming in uh, a little bit blind. Uh, and you know how I work, mm -hmm. so, we'll, so we'll, <laughs> we'll get some questions from me as well. We did ask each of the five participants to give us a little video to mm -hmm. introduce themselves to you, so that's where we'll start. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Amanda. I'm from Scarborough, Ontario. I'm a wife and a mother to two young girls, and I'm currently on mat leave. Two important issues in this election for our family are childcare and housing. Childcare, because when I go back to work full time, we'll only be able to afford to put the girls in part time care. Luckily, we have the support from my parents and my in laws. Secondly is housing, because we currently reside and own a two-bedroom condo. We're slowly growing out of it, and we'd eventually like a bigger space, inside and out, for our girls to grow up in. All right, over to you, Amanda. Amanda. Hi. So between childcare and housing, we're absolutely strapped. Mm -hmm. We consider ourselves a middle class, but we're grasping at straws just to stay there. You want to bring out a universal care across the country? Right. When is this going to happen? In six months? In a year? We need this to happen now. We needed this money and this care yesterday. Oh, I totally agree with you, Amanda, and I totally, I mean, number one, thank you for taking such good care of your kids, even though it's a struggle. It's really hard. And we want universal child care. We'll put in a billion dollars a year to make sure it's not just child care, but early quality education in our child care program. Mm -hmm. And we have to make life more affordable. Now, when can I do it? Depends. If I become prime minister, we'll work on it within the first year to deliver universal child care. We also we need to think about what we do as Greens is the whole picture. So if your child care is located near where you work, easier to get there on public transit, less stress to get to child care spaces. But honestly, what Canadians are going through in affordability is a crisis. And I'll just, I can just promise you that whatever position I hold after the election, I'll do my best. But we really need it right away. I know. Um, as you can see, we live in a two-bedroom condo. Mm -hmm. We're slowly growing out of it, and we can't afford to move into something bigger. It's not only my family, but it's other families as well. So we need something done now. I know. So we need to know what's going to be happening if you are elected into office, what's going to happen right away. We can change the tax code to encourage the building of purpose-built rental housing. We can increase access to a more affordable housing by dealing with some of the perverse pressures on our supply to housing. Airbnbs have taken a lot of actual housing out of the marketplace. We can build new housing and we need to hold the prices at levels people can afford. I mean, in 1975, people in your position had to scrimp and save five years to save up enough for their first down payment on their first home. In the GTA now, it's 21 years. I don't need to tell you this. In Vancouver, it's 29 years. It's not sustainable. Housing needs to be a right. Sorry to interrupt, but when will this happen? Because we need this housing now. I know. 
in office as prime minister, we will have a minister responsible for housing exclusively. We will put the funding into it. We will talk to the development community. It's not something that you can snap your fingers and everyone's in an affordable home overnight, but we can make everything more affordable by bringing in childcare that's affordable, bringing down, eliminating drug prices through pharmacare. Life has to be more affordable. People are, like you and your partner, working so hard with jobs held down and yet can't get out of a two-bedroom condo with two kids. That's not right. That's not the Canada we think we should have. I'm 65. What you're living through now was not what I faced even when I had childcare struggles. Things were more affordable. And it's just, all I can say is, I know it's not right. I'll do my best to make change happen fast. So there won't be any, you can't give us a definitive timeline. Well, if, I was a, if I was Prime Minister and had what was needed, the affordability crisis, people would feel it easing within the first year. Within the next five years, we could see everybody being able to get to a home they can afford. Okay. You good? So how, how would that work exactly? It, it, over, over five years, Canadians would get to a home they could afford. How, how, how does that work? Because housing is, is, most people do regard it as an investment where they put their equity sometimes for retirement. Well, it's a, one thing is to have an investment in your home that you actually live in. Sure. Another is to see people speculating with homes that stand empty. So we need to deal with that. That's a distortion. We never used to have a situation where homes in a community were out of the reach of the people who lived in that community. It used to kind of set its own level because no one wanted to try to sell a home that no one could afford. With international speculation, with Airbnbs, there's new pressures. But when you look at it, CMHC has now set a goal <clears throat> that by 2030, every Canadian is in a home that they want, that they can afford. Well, we just need to double that by doing more, by being more committed, by getting, we, we need to change the tax system so that developers can get a reward for purpose-built rental housing, which creates some breathing room in the marketplace that allows people to afford a, a, more, a, a bigger place that they may be renting for a while, saving up for when they get the equity for a down payment. So would you, would you put that speculative tax in place that other parties have promised? We have not put in a speculative tax, but we are taxing Airbnbs. We are looking at ways that we can ensure that housing is more affordable and through different models, co-housing, cooperative housing. There are models that work that help get people into a home that meets their needs. And that includes building within inner cities, more of the densification that needs to be done. But we need to break this... Uh, well, actually, we need to relink as opposed to break what's affordable in a community. People should be able to have a home where they work, live in a community where they work, and not have to be further and further afield from downtown cores because they're pushed out by the kind of crisis we've seen in our major cities. How, how much did you say your child care plan would cost? A billion dollars a year. A billion dollars a year. You've got that, you've got free tuition at 16 billion, you've got pharmacare at 27 billion dollars. That's right. Um, where does all that money come from? Well, if you look at the other side of our budget ledger, you'll see the revenues on the current plans, at barring a recession or something else that causes us to rethink the risks that we see globally, we can pay down deficit and balance the budget in five years because of revenue sources such as increasing the tax on large corporations, not changing tax on small business. We can increase tax revenue coming into the government of Canada by taxing things like the Airbnbs and Amazon and Netflix and Googles and Facebooks. When you tax things, that, that, that affects Canadians. They're, Canadians use Airbnbs. That's right. Canadians use... All, all they these things also use about. our hotels, which are regulated and have to employ people. And there are some things that are distortions in the marketplace because the virtual e-commerce uh, economy is not without its cost to people who've been regulated. So the Ubers hurt the registered and regulated taxi industry. The Airbnbs undermine the hotels and Airbnb and regular B&Bs. So you look at that package, your local bookstore suffers when we order from Amazon, yeah. it gets delivered to our door, not to keep the money in our local economy by shopping local. So that's just one example. But in terms of housing, we have to look at the models okay. that work and we have to bring back the funding through the federal government into the housing market, not just for social housing, where housing is a right, okay. but also in the affordability crisis for people in the marketplace who can't afford a decent home. Amanda, how do you feel about those answers? I still need yeah. to know what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, yeah. because time is just getting away from us. Yeah. And by the time, uh, what I'm afraid of is when this universal child care comes into place, I won't need it anymore but I might not be in the middle class section anymore. Uh, my my uh, social economical level might go low and 
like I said, we're grasping at straws right now just yeah. to keep in the middle class. All right, here, let's get to our next voter now. Hi, my name's Danny Onbright. I'm a fourth generation grain farmer from Grayson, Saskatchewan, hoping to raise the fifth generation of grain farmers. Sorry for looking a little scruffy, but it's middle of harvest and it's like the playoffs, so you don't shave. Anyways, we're talking about the election. We're talking about agriculture. We have major issues with trade. We have major issues with labor shortages. But one thing I'd like to talk about that nobody seems to talk about is using agriculture in the fight against climate change. Nobody's policies from none of the parties address the good that agriculture could do if it is deployed correctly. Thank you. All right, Danny, my friend, off to you. That's legit because <laughs> nobody's party, and I consider you the most serious about climate change out there, yeah. and you don't even include agriculture in the fight against climate change. We actually do, so I'm apologizing if our platform hasn't been really, em the platform text and what we talk about includes agriculture, because the soil holds carbon. Your farming practices help in the fight against global warming. We recognize that, and the farming community plays a critical role. Regenerative agriculture to ensure that our soil quality is there to hold carbon. So we know that you're facing a lot of challenges because of the climate crisis. This growing season for Saskatchewan but has where been is the a real money? challenge. Because you recognize my emissions, mm -hmm. because you're recognizing everybody's emissions with a carbon tax, mm -hmm. but that loop is not closed. That money does not come back to agriculture. Agriculture can do so much in the fight, but nobody is over here saying, well, yeah, we should deploy the agriculture. Because, because uh, I have to get this out there, because if we're serious, agriculture is Canada's natural advantage. We have huge amount of forest, huge amount of farmland, and that all can be used in the fight. I agree with you, Danny. I don't know how we, uh, if you look at our platform, you'll see that there is funding to go back to farmers who are participating, who are making sure that we're sequestering carbon in the soils. We have programs in there to help. I mean, I'm so glad to see you as a young farmer because we know the average age of farmers in this country is closer to my age than yours. We need young farmers or we're not going to have food. And we need to make sure that farming is sustainable so people who are in the farming community can make their income on farm in secure markets. So we have land grants in our program. We have money to support existing farming. We have money to ensure, by the way, you talked about export policies. We'd like to see more of the food consumed in Canada grown in Canada, and we want to support that. So there are bottom line numbers, and I can, and you can find them online. Well, I can show you the numbers. I mean, yeah, but, I didn't want to come out here and spit out a bunch of stats out here. Yeah. Nobody comes out and talks to agriculture issues. I mean, the last two governments have been actually pretty bad. Yeah. The Liberals. Terrible. Yeah. Well, we find something we agree upon so very <laughs> fully. Uh, but I want to do whatever we can for greens to be understood by the agricultural community as on board. A lot of our green candidates are farmers. They're they understand the challenge. Well, quite a few. The issue, though, is your ag policy is from like 1954. No, it's up. You, no, it's really quite no. A I read through it. It's you. You. You're missing nine out of ten farmers. And. The thing is, I know you probably don't think farmers are going to vote for you. Oh, I do. The problem with if you take money out of my farm is it, it hits my profitability level. Our margins are small as it is. I mean, our business risk management programs are, they were gutted under the conservative government. The liberals didn't restore them. Somebody's going to have to come here and wake up. Like you said, farmers are retiring. Yeah. We don't have succession plans. Danny, you are one of the industries most at risk from climate change. You feel it every day. We want to be there to make it livable, affordable, and profitable for you to be part of the campaign. As you said from your very first words, farming and farmers are part of the solution to climate crisis. I couldn't agree with you more. Okay, let, let me let me intervene for a couple points. Just on, on the decision that you want to have more uh, domestic local food production. I'm wondering what that would mean for a farmer like Danny, because it, he, he would need to export too, uh, to if he's making canola to China and other places. So, so are, are they out of luck then? If you're trying to refocus on on local food, we production? want to reduce the greenhouse gas footprint, the carbon miles of our groceries. That means the more that we can grow in Canada, the more we can encourage that we have farming practices and products that we buy in Canada instead of right now, if you're looking at our fisheries, which drive me crazy, the separation of the fishermen from the license for the fish means that in British Columbia, you can pick up a package that says wild BC smoked salmon. You turn it over, it says product of Canada, processed and packaged in the People's Republic of China. I don't think that makes sense. Greens don't think that makes sense. We want more value added, more milling of our flowers. I don't know, are you growing legumes? 
Saskatchewan is now the biggest producer of legumes. We need our legumes from but, Saskatchewan and not imported but, but, from other countries. But that's countries. fine, but don't, don't, the, the biggest markets, trading markets, are not within our borders. That, that is how we will make money. So I wonder what that would mean for someone like Danny who well, wants to have success. We want to be able to ensure that farmers make enough money on farm. Most farmers have to take jobs off farm to break even. <laughs> that's not right. And what we want to do is make sure, yes, there's an export market, but let's do more with self-sufficiency of agriculture in Canada. Let's grow more locally. This also helps fight climate change by creating local gardens, which also helps sequester carbon. Rooftop gardens mean a building uses 25% less air conditioning. These solutions tie into each sure. other. Uh, how much do you sell overseas? All of it. Yeah. In Western Canada, if we don't export it, there's no point of growing it because we grow so much. Yeah. Like when we talk about acres, we're talking about, what is it, 110 million acres? Like, we can't physically eat all of the grains that I produce. <laughs> well, I, I didn't like, say, but I didn't you say. You know, but like, I, I know where you're coming from, okay. but like, this well, is so the export part. This is why it's so critical about export markets. Well, you, because yeah. if there's no export home for it, we don't eat enough in Canada well, listen, of what how, I grow. Look at how vulnerable we are to world markets. We have China deciding to cut the sale of canola. Suddenly everybody has to plant something different. All we're saying is Green says food self-sufficiency matters. And once Canadians have local food, it's not all of it by any means. We're not shutting down exports altogether. But we believe there should be a portion of what farmers grow in Canada that gets consumed by Canadians, okay. gets processed and packaged to support local economies here and export the excess. Okay, unbelievably Danny was nervous. I know that you would probably don't because he didn't look nervous to me. Let's move on to our next Thank questioner. Good job, Danny. Thank you. <laughs> nice to meet you. My name is Shirley Frost. I live in Whitehorse, Yukon, but come from a small community of Old Crow in northern Yukon. I'm an, a mother and a grandmother and an elder of this First Nation. The main concern for me is the climate crisis and food security. They go hand in hand for us up here in the north. And that's because we live in the north where we see the effects of climate change on a daily basis. The Gwich'in have been lobbying for protection of the calving grounds for 31 years. Okay, Shirley, five minutes. Um, yes, I come from um, the north where we see and experience climate, the climate crises on a daily basis. Uh, the animals and the fish and and the waterfowl that come to our sanctuaries all behave very differently. So we see it firsthand. Um, I, what I'd like to know is um, what, you, what your thoughts are and what you plan to do um, if, you were to, um, if we were to uh, vote for you. Thank you. Well, first of all, Shirley, thank you. And uh, the Gwich'in Territory and Old Crow are so important. I've worked well before I ever joined the Green Party. I was working with Gwich'in community to try to stop the drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, more imperiled now than ever. Mm -hmm. What we see happening in the Arctic, we talk about it as like a canary in the coal mine, not just for Canada, but globally, because as you say, you see it day to day. Mm -hmm. Our plan is the most ambitious plan of any party to address the climate crisis. We call it Mission Possible. It's not mission easy, but we start with knowing that we've got to keep the Arctic cold enough to keep most of the permafrost frozen, or that's, that's really a massive climate impact for the planet that can't be sustained. Mm -hmm. So hold, it, moving off fossil fuels as quickly as possible, ramping up renewable energy as quickly as possible, and working with indigenous peoples as leadership so everyone plays a role in this. Every municipal government, every province, civil society, indigenous people, we all have a role to play. I was talking with Danny. If we have smaller local backyard gardens, that's also helping. If we get to heat at depth at geothermal so that in the north we can have more greenhouses, more food that's local, because I know the price of food in the north is a scandal. It's really hard for people to have their grocery basket full without it blowing the mind of anyone who lives in southern Canada. The price of groceries is really a problem it's in the north. unaffordable. Um, to the climate crises, I call it, because it really is a crisis, goes hand in hand with our food security. We're born with this responsibility as stewards of the land. And it's to us, we, that's what we live for. Right. And we'd like, what I want to know is how do we educate yeah. the rest of Canada and how do we educate the voters yeah. of Canada 
about this, this crisis that's happening in, in our northern territories, in the northern world yeah. of, our, the of our earth, yeah. of our mother earth. Yeah, now when we, we talk about the circumpolar north, we're looking at the changes, as you say, right around the world globally. Yeah. We are committed to recognizing indigenous leadership. When you speak of the relationship with the earth, recognizing a responsibility for stewardship. Those words, I think, resonate with a lot of settler culture Canadians. When you have, I mean, I'm willing to say as a, as a settler culture Canadian and federal party political leader, the earth is our mother. We are killing our mother. We have to identify in very personal terms. The economy is worshipped. Okay, we need to make sure the economy is okay. We need to have a prosperous country. But we also need to resonate to a responsibility to the fact that we don't have any economy without a healthy planet. And when we see the changes happening in the north, the permafrost melting, the ice disappearing, this has global consequences. What will you do like for the children? How do we reach the children of the Arctic, the children of Canada, so that they become responsible citizens? Well, I think our, for our children, and particularly when we think of indigenous children, um, we as a party completely support the human rights finding. We readjusted our budget to put in the $2 billion that Cindy Blackstock's group just won from the Human Rights Tribunal. Indigenous children have not been getting a fair shake compared to settler culture and other children. We want to put in place, though, for all children in Canada, that Canada honour the UN Declaration on the Rights of the Child, that we put in place an, an, uh, an advocate for children in the federal government level so that we're looking at issues for does every child get a good start in life? That early childhood education that Amanda wants, well, how do we make sure that we put a priority on our children? Because nothing's more important, not to any Canadian. Okay, I I'm going to go now too, Shirley, if that's okay. Okay. Uh, what do Canadians need to give up? in order to be good citizens on climate change? Because it can't stay the way it is, I don't think, with your plan. So what do they need to be okay with giving up? Our plan doesn't ask people to give up anything. It asks people to be engaged in a more meaningful connection to government as citizens of a country where they're in charge. But you've we need to you push want to get trans rid of fossil fuels. Yes, right. You've you doubled push... the targets that the Liberals have in place right. to reach by 2030. I, I don't see how you do those things without some discomfort. Without the discomfort people... is far more severe if we ignore the climate crisis. I, I, I give and you that, but what is, what, what is the discomfort that your plan would create for Canadians? I don't see it as discomfort to plug in your car instead of going to a gas station. We are not asking individual Canadians to take on a cost. We're asking the federal government to show the kind of leadership that existed in the 80s. You know, when we decided to protect the ozone layer in this country, which Canada did in the lead, we didn't say, gee, are people prepared to pay more if we lose the propellants in the hairspray that we use? No one actually noticed the difference when we got rid of chlorofluorocarbons. Fossil fuels are more difficult, mm -hmm. and we need to make sure every worker in the fossil fuel sector knows that their, their skills are transferable, and we need all those skills. But the cost to this society of holding to the current target, which is completely inconsistent with global survival. The current target of the Liberals is the same one left behind by Stephen Harper. Obviously, Shears is worse, and, and Jagmeet Singh's isn't any better. So where we end up being is, we have a chance to ensure our kids have a livable world. And all people ask me about is what we're prepared to sacrifice. Why is it scarier to talk about saving ourselves and the transformation of an economy where we will have new jobs, what? new businesses will start up, new technologies are raring to go. Okay, so, so I, I think it's probably scary to the transition that you're talking about for oil and gas workers. Um, how quickly does that happen? Do you, do, do, is it five years, 10 years? How quickly should they be prepared to walk away from jobs that I guess would no longer exist under a green government and move into something different? Well, that's why we start with banning the ex importation of fossil fuels from other countries so that within Canada we give workers at least this five to 10 year, 10 years before we're out of the oil sands, right? So, and we'd still be using oil from Hibernia even longer. We need to reduce very dramatically. And there are some who say I'm not, that the Greens don't push far enough, fast enough. We're twice as tough a target because the target we've chosen is the one that is dictated by science. We're not making these things up as political promises. Our platform is driven by the science that says if we go above 1.5 degree global average temperature increase, we will lose all Arctic ice in 
at the North Pole. We will not be able to hold on to human civilization through the lifetime of our children alive so, today. So 10 years is, is, is 10 what? years is when we're 60% below 2005 levels, carbon neutral by 2050. Okay, let's get to our next question. Hi, my name is Matthew Mozafari. I live in Toronto and I'm a passionate software developer. I'm 21 years old and this would be my first federal election. I'm very excited, but also taking this very seriously. Since I was 16 years old, I knew that I wanted to be involved in the STEM industry. Fast forward a year later, I built some tools and a mobile app, which are currently being used in the real world. Technology impacts societies and the world around us. That's why it should be taken very seriously. Since I work in the industry, I've seen colleagues leave Canada to pursue other technology opportunities abroad. The reason why I'm undecided for this federal election is because I want to know what our candidates are doing to resolve these issues. Okay, Matthew. All right, so I'm involved in tech and I studied computer science at my university. And it became very apparent to me that the way we were being taught these tools and these technologies wasn't the right way. I actually, in 2016, wanted to drop out. And then what saved me was the fact that I started my own company. I, I started to apply myself further. Yeah. Um, when I was in first year, I made a bunch of friends. And then in second year, these same friends in computer science ended up dropping out. What I want to know is how you're going to be taking um, this, this robot tax mm -hmm. and investing it. Because mm -hmm. right now, uh, on your platform, you claim that we're going to be putting it back into the education system, which is great, but it's more important to not just invest it into education, but to actually invest in building a new institutional framework for education, which mm -hmm. helps people transition into the technology industry much more smoothly. Yeah. Well, first of all, let me just say the robot tax is one that is a topic for discussion because artificial intelligence and automation are going to make their bigger impact down the road. So we're forward looking and we're knowing this is going to hit us. It's going to hit our, it's going to hit the world of work. We don't want to be unprepared for it. So we're not putting in place a robot tax like in the first year or anything like that. We need to figure out what kind of automation requires replacement of revenue to the government. But for education, we want to eliminate tuition, as we've come up earlier in the program. Rosemary mentioned the price of that. But eliminating tuition is something that a lot of industrialized countries in Europe have done. They can afford it. We can afford it. And we also want to eliminate the student debt that is occurring and crushing your generation. So we want to invest in post-secondary institutions and our trade schools and colleges with $10 billion to make sure that they're financially secure. Uh, I, I totally agree with you reinvesting into education, putting in more money. Yeah. But we needed to go into actual reframing right. the structures that are used for these curriculums. I was very involved in my school. Uh, we helped change these curriculums a bit, yeah. but obviously it has to go much further than that. We need to apply our, ourselves further. And technology, it's, it's going to impact literally every industry. That's every right. industry everyone is in, in this yeah. room right now, yeah. it's going to impact everyone. So right? what, we're not, what you're saying is what you, were, what you were getting in school was not keeping up with what was happening in the real world. It, so people felt a disconnect. So, so here's <laughs> what we need to do is we think we need to unleash uh, the brilliance of people in the tech sector to allow the disruptive technologies to take their place. We are so used to looking at our policies through the rear view mirror yep. that we design our government policies to reward the businesses that are already on their way to extinction, like fossil fuels. We need to open up the horizons for disruptive technologies, yep. new businesses, and take young, brilliant people like you. And I know I'm pandering to you because you're not a decided voter, yep. but you're obviously brilliant. <laughs> so I, we need to work together to figure out how do we keep our educational institutions vital and engaged sure. with changes as they come because the sure. world's changing so fast mm -hmm. my daughter's partner's job didn't exist even well even forget it yeah. when I was a kid you know like 10 years yeah. ago the jobs of tomorrow aren't even possible to envision as you and I sit yeah, here. For sure. And you brought up how uh, like this affects businesses, and that's actually my next point. So let's say we make it through this education system, yeah. we enter the technology industry, or STEM in general, and we start a business. I've worked with a lot of startups, and I've helped them scale out like yeah. with their technologies, and they either make it far and do amazing things, but this Canadian talent and these Canadian startups, yeah. they end up leaving and they go to other countries which allow them to grow and thrive further. And I want Canadian talent to stay in Canada. Yeah. And um, it, it, it becomes difficult because a lot of startups, they enter this concept called technology jail, which is basically when they're not only limited in terms of their like 
like their team and their talent, but they're also restricted in terms of investments and angel investors yeah. and loans because the, the like in Canada, these institutions, they don't recognize certain tangible uh, technologies. They need to like they need to see actual tools and hardware. Oh, I know. Listen, what I think is I've seen a lot of private sector entrepreneurs doing across Canada is self-starting little incubator hubs. So somebody who's brilliant and has a new technology and a new idea has got help from other entrepreneurs. Government should promote those things and fund Sure. them so they can grow a whole ecosystem it of entrepreneurs. It's difficult though because I've worked at incubators like some of the best in the world like the DMZ and 111 yeah. and these incubators do amazing things but uh, they end up like some of these companies end up leaving again and they go to like the Silicon Valley for example yeah. and it's something that we need to really really focus on. Yeah I, I couldn't agree with you more and I hope we can follow up sometime. We didn't get this this format doesn't give us enough time. No but I get a little yeah. time too so that's yeah. the way it goes. Uh, I just want to go back to the robot tax. Thanks for asking about it. It was on my list too because it did seem to me last week that you were proposing a robot tax. Well, so is that not our, what you're doing? If you look in our budget you won't see a line item called robot tax. It's okay. not a proposal for imminent use. What it is is that we need to get ahead of the discussion on automation and artificial intelligence. We're the only party that has it out there. Workers want to know. The changes that could happen in our society are, as Matt saying, we can't even anticipate today the way these things are going to move. So we want to talk about, and there are a number of think tanks around the world who are looking at this, if we're losing a worker and replacing that worker with a robot, shouldn't we collect the payroll taxes from the robot so we continue to have the revenue for people who are, at this point, maybe we have to imagine in the future a world without work. Well, what is our meaningful choice in life if it's not work? I'm, How I'm do we not sure it's fair that? to say no other party is talking about automation. Well, I, 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 I think. Well, I, I haven't think, doubted I think, in their platform okay. yet. Wouldn't this discourage innovation? Wouldn't it scare off companies? Why would a company come and start a why would a startup come here if you're going to tax the people that the robots that work there? I just I, how would that foster innovation? It fosters innovation because innovators and entrepreneurs are really looking at the idea. The best ideas come from people who are fascinated by the project and not always the bottom line. Now, our bottom line for innovators will continue to be profitable for many other aspects of our <clears throat> platform. What we're saying about this possibility and again, backing up and saying, we're talking about what the future of work is going to look like. You know, I met with the head of the Canadian Labour Congress. This is the kind of thing they think about. What does the future of work look like? We'd like to have that conversation. We're not proposing a robot tax in the next two, three, even five, ten years. We want to talk about it ahead of time so we have the tools that are helpful to make sure Canadians can face a future without being afraid that the world of automation means no one's any longer going to be able to find a job in the field for which they're trained. Okay. Matthew, you good? Uh, one last thing. When you, when you <laughs> invest this... <laughs> I should never have asked. Yeah, don't ask that. Okay. Uh, when, when we're investing in bringing these people that have left due to, due to the automation, yeah. you need to not only invest in them, but also invest, again, in that that framework, like this institutionalized uh, like system yeah. that teaches people about technology, so it'll help speed up this process. Okay. That's that's, I think, that's I think, I think he's ready to run for office. Yeah, All right, let's good. move on to our next right. voter. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm Christina Pizzona, Ontario. I'm a widow with two grown daughters. Last year I retired from a fulfilling teaching career. I love being outdoors. Years ago I completed an undergraduate in environmental studies. I maintain my interest in environmental issues and do my best to minimize my environmental footprint. I think all people see and understand the impacts of climate change and yet, and yet, I don't see enough people willing to give up environmentally harmful and wasteful conveniences. My question is, what will your party do to change the public's mindset to put the environment first? Okay, Christina, over to you. Thank you. Hi, it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, I'm here to tell you that it's just not working. Four decades ago, I completed a degree in environmental studies. Then the scientists told us that unfettered uh, human activity would lead to a climate crisis. And here we are, same message. So my question to you is how would you um, help individuals, uh, businesses, industries change their mindset from mm, convenience uh, to being more 
ecologically minded. Yeah. Well, Christina, first of all, thank you for all the things that you do from the video. It's very obvious that you do a lot to walk the talk. Uh, we want to do things like encouraging people to know that our throwaway society can be reinvented into a durable society. We put the right to repair in our platform so that people who buy, you know, you buy your toaster, you can no longer ever get it fixed. You buy a, a table lamp, that's it. We need to be able to say these are goods that we want to keep. We don't want them ending up in the trash heap. It's not easy to do that in a society that has been rewired in our lifetimes to one where everything is throwaway. In terms of climate, we just need the leadership because the plans that we will put in place, I know if we call out to Canadians and say, how many people want solar panels on the roofs? Hands up, well, hands up. Mm -hmm. How many people want to help plant trees? Hands up. How many people really want to get rid of the commute in a gas guzzling car and shift over to convenient public transit from anywhere in Canada, including rural and remote communities? That's the plan and it's an exciting one and I think people will want to step up. I agree, but at the same time, I have evidence of people not following through. So for example, we have a great recycling program in Toronto. Two problems with that. There's no um, accountability for not recycling. So mm -hmm. some neighbors, I never see them put out their recycling bin mm -hmm. um, I, or their compost bin. And also still to this day, you can go and buy yourself a cup of coffee or a, a juice and you'll be given a plastic straw, whether you want one or not, or a plastic lid totally unrecyclable. So this idea of convenience has sort of um, become foremost in our minds and we need something to help us redirect our yeah. thinking, shift our minds to being more ecologically minded. I, I want to know, what, like, how does that, what does that look like? Yeah, I, I honestly, I think a lot of people want to do more, but their barriers are there. As you said, you make a cup of tea and there's plastics. If we ban single use plastic items, which the Green Party platform will do, there's no need of handing out plastic straws, plastic forks, plastic garbage, plastic bags. We can avoid all of that by just saying, it's not available anymore. We got rid of it through a ban. Now the Liberals say they want to, but they haven't said on what time frame or what items are covered. Our platform says so. And most people, I think, really want to take responsibility. But the system in which we live, our economy, is hardwired to fossil fuels and somewhat hardwired to garbage. And I'd say of recycling rates, people have lost confidence because there's so much in the news about exactly. this isn't really waste diversion. This ended up in the same pile of garbage that, by the way, ended up, you know. So you don't, we want to be able to know that it's, there's accountability. We have an urban forest of newspapers that really does help defer de and keep people from having to constantly log. We can reuse, reduce and recycle a tremendous amount, but glass and aluminum and paper and cardboard are really readily recyclable, mm -hmm. not so much plastics. Exactly, and then you buy, a, a, for example, a potted plant and that particular pot that it comes in, and you have no choice, it comes in a plastic pot, but it's not a recyclable pot. My big question is, I truly believe that you're going to hold the balance of power. Mm -hmm. How are you going to work with Trudeau or sure, should they um, become prime minister to help them shift their mindset to be to make ecologically based decisions? Well, I hope we elect enough Green members of parliament across the country so that we can have the right kind of influence that says, we want to hold the line so that the other parties keep their promises. We want to take a big broom to Ottawa and do some ethical house cleaning. We've got a lot of work there. And we need to make sure that when we work together, it's based on principle, not a quest for power, but principle. Can we actually achieve what we promised to do in Paris? Our kids' future depends on it. It won't be easy, but I will not ever, ever waver on principle, and neither will the Green MPs who go to Ottawa with me. I can work with anybody. Because bottom line, we're all human beings. I find good in every single person within so my work that, in Ottawa. So you feel that you will be able to, on a daily basis, push your, the environmental agenda regardless? Environment, economy, survival, they all go hand in hand. Yeah, I do think so. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank good you. job. <laughs> I, I have a few more minutes. So I'm going to do a few more, if that's okay. Um, what happens to TMX, uh, the, the, the pipeline that we ha all now own? Do you sell it? Do you lose the $4.5 billion? What oh, happens oh, to it? You, there's two different issues here, <laughs> yeah. Rosemary. The first is the pipeline we bought, the $4.5 billion, 65-year-old pipeline. That is a business and operation, and nobody's, no one thinks that we've 
got a good deal there. The 4.5 right. billion is gone. The, but you're not going to sell that. You're going to keep it because well, we already own it. No one's going to buy it. I mean, it's $4.5 billion. Kinder Morgan spent $500 million for it. We're, we're not shrewd businessmen here, Mr. Bill Morneau. Not so smart. So we've got $4.5 billion. They're still laughing in Texas. It's gone. But the next phase, yes. which is a brand new pipeline, yes. it's called an expansion, but it's a second pipeline yes. altogether that we will have to spend 10 to $13 billion to build. Cancelled. That's cancelled. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about your platform a little bit more. It did not get uh, great reviews. Uh, yes, it, it did. If you let me finish. Uh, oh, well, of the, course. The, the Green, <laughs> this is what Kevin Page said. He was the former parliamentary budget officer. He said that it failed to make realistic and credible economic and fiscal projections. It said that one of the major issues was that you had billions in new spending commitments that would require massive revenue tools of about $60 billion per year. That's more than 2.5% of Canada's GDP. How are you able to find a bunch of money and balance the books within five years? Uh, let me just back up and say that Kevin Page's analysis, he started it by saying at this point, and unfortunately the background documentation hadn't reached him and he's now reviewing it. So stay tuned for what Kevin Page sees when he says when he reviews our whole fiscal plan. I think it will be a passing grade because we do assess global risks and challenges in the global economy. We do look at Canada's fiscal sustainability and we do have revenue sources to cover our promises and we pledged to that and unfortunately in uh, a summary for media purposes of the released budget, a lot of the technical documentation wasn't provided. It, it has been provided now to his operation at University of Ottawa. We'll see what they say once they've studied it. But people that have looked at it um, would say, well, why would we give you a chance of government if you can't even get the math to add up properly? As I said, Kevin Page is reviewing it and the math does add up. So I, I'm very confident that our budget is solid and sound and does what Canadians most want, which is actual action, not a serious... Most budgets recently, I mean, going back 10 years, we have budgets that look like Christmas trees with ornaments here, ornaments there, a bit for this group, a bit for that group. We have to actually deal with solving problems, not putting band-aids on them. That does cost money. We believe in the public sphere. We believe in the role of government, and we know that there's revenue out there, whether it's in offshore tax havens or through stock option loopholes. We found a lot of revenue that covers our promises, and that math does add up. Okay, uh, it, as you, you referred to it here, um, and, and lots of people are talking about whether you could hold the balance of power, mm -hmm. what influence you'd like to have inside the House of Commons. Who, at this point, is palatable for you? The difficulty with the first-past-the-post system is that I can't say now. If we were in a proportional representation government, which of course we must be because Trudeau said we would be a thousand times, but clearly we're not. So first-past-the-post means that going to the polls, every party, and I hate politics but for this reason, is worried about hanging on to what's so-called their vote. Mm -hmm. So in New Zealand, where in a former first past the post country, they are in proportional representation, my New Zealand Green friends were able to go to the polls with Labour and the woman who's now the Prime Minister of New Zealand and say, we'll work together. We're okay with that. Fine, but this is the system that we live in. That's and and, you, don't, and you don't think you're going to win, do you? win my seat in Saanich Gulf Islands. No, That's the only place my, well, my name is on the ballot in Saanich Gulf Islands. We don't have elections for presidents in this country, and I know you know that, but everybody kind of slides into that. Like, Do you think you're going to form government? If we did, it would be very good for democracy, for this country, and for our future. So, Honestly, I think that we'll be very, very much larger caucus with substantial influence from hard-working, ethical people who work for their communities. And, how do you, and then how do you determine where that support goes? Case by case, you take the person who's well, doing the, less, the least bit of harm to the environment. How do you approach it? There is no second chance right now on climate science. Greta Thunberg and her analysis, even though she's only 16 years old, is the best scientific analysis that we've heard in this election campaign comes from a 16-year-old girl from Sweden. So the reality is we don't get a second chance. If the window closes on holding to 1.5 degrees Celsius, it closes not in years, but in months. So we won't compromise on that. We also are prepared to work with anyone because my colleagues as I said Greens around the world have negotiated Greens in British Columbia have negotiated you talk to everyone and see where do we have common ground because common ground is essential if we're going to work our way do through you have this common ground with conservatives on well if you want to talk about individual conservatives you I, bet. No, I don't with the party 
the party's policies are not consistent. But I have to tell you, when the Australian Greens were negotiating with uh, Julia Gillard, she'd run an entire election campaign saying she'd never bring in a carbon tax. To become prime minister, she brought one in and a very aggressive climate plan. So I don't take as fixed the positions that political party leaders, whether they continue after the election, we don't know. If they have a bad result, one might step down and another is the interim leader of the Conservative Party. If I'd been negotiating after 2015, had we had a minority parliament, I would have been talking to Ronna Ambrose. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end with the same question I've been giving everybody, and, and the question is this. What, what quality do you personally have that would make you a good prime minister? I'm not interested in personal power or aggrandizement. I'm worried about my kids' future. I'm better qualified than the other leaders, with all due respect. At 65 years old, having worked in government, having worked as a lawyer, having understood public policy issues and taught in universities, I actually know what governments can do and I know what we must do, I know where the tools are, and I'm prepared to use them in the interests of my country. Okay. Thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> Thanks to all of you, our lovely questioners, and to the audience for being here, and of course to you. Thanks for making the time. Thank you. Tomorrow, you'll hear from NDP leader Jagmeet Singh, and if you've missed our conversations with Mr. Trudeau or Mr. Scheer, you can find them on CBC News app and on CBC Gem. I'm Rosemary Barton. I'll see you back here tomorrow. Come over and you can say hello to everybody again. Leave everybody.